The Red List Index and the Living Planet Index speak to conservation status category changes in population trends. But they may not respond to very specific interests. So for example, the Red List Index may be reflecting um, how many birds are ca classified as critically endangered in South Africa. But there may be somebody plowing Table Mountain into a cornfield, okay? It's simply unresponsive to what may be very important and very critical conservation um, issues. It's too coarse and it's too inertia laden. And then I'm gonna go back to my old theme of nobody takes care of your interests except you. So think about it, the red list index can't really be implemented for Ghana because we have to wait for the next global amphibian status report and see how many species made that shift to the right or shift to the left along that endangerment spectrum. And Essentially, these indices become dependent on authorities, IUCN, BirdLife International, or the grand swell of science in the case of the Living Planet Index where who's publishing population trends around the world, but nobody's gonna look after the interests of Ghana or of the DRC or of Benin because these are depending, in the best case, they're depending on people with global conservation interests. Okay, so I, Jorge and I have both been very focused on this panorama that the metrics of biodiversity intactness or loss that are in vogue are not really what we want. So what I'm gonna show in the rest of this presentation is just one line of exploration. There are several others. Uh, I, I took the easy way out. I'm showing you this one, bye bye. Uh, I'm showing you this one because um, it's work that Jorge and I have done, and so it's very easy to pick out slides and show them to you. So we started out with just some very simple things. Could we develop a niche model in which land cover was an element, and then use multi-temporal land cover information as a way of tracking population losses. And so this is an early publication, early means 2006, I guess, um, an early publication where essentially we, we looked at this phenomenon. This is everywhere you see gray or black is lowland rainforest in southern Mexico, okay? And so, originally, it did all of this, okay, just like that. And a little bit here in southern Chiapas. But everywhere where you see black, that rainforest has been lost. So it's a pretty sad situation. Essentially, all of the rainforest in Veracruz is gone. And really, the only places where you have retention is in this region, it's called the Chimalapas region, in northeastern Chiapas, and in parts of the Yucatan Peninsula. Although there's an aridity, oops, sorry, 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 sorry. There's an aridity gradient from here to here, so this is pretty good tall, wet rainforest, and this is drier, and this is drier, and this is very dry. But my point is, we can get that information from remotely sensed data. 
Okay, we can track the retraction of vegetation types. And so what we did was for a bunch of species, we trained niche models based on original vegetation plus climate. And we projected the niche models onto um, land use land cover maps from 1976, 1993, and 2000. And we did this for all of the J's. These are corvids, uh, J's in, in Mexico. And basically you can see some species uh, where we don't see any loss. And we see other species where we see 35% of their distributional potential lost. This was an early exploration. This is the first, first playing. We can look at how those losses add up geographically. And we found some really interesting kind of spatial concentrations of loss. So this kind of took us into a next exploration. This was done in, in Europe, um, kind of bridging over with some people who do policy at the European Environmental Agency. Um, and I just wanted to show you this graph where we brought in a lot more factors. We can start with the original distribution shown here, and then we can estimate how much of that original distribution would be lost to, for example, inundation by sea level rise. Raise the sea level one meter or six meters, how much do you lose? And what you can see for this particular species is, is that almost nothing is lost. We bring in land cover change, and you see we're losing 30%-ish of the distribution. But if we combine land cover change with climate change, we can lose another 30%. So again, this is just kind of a multifactorial exploration bringing in a little bit more complexity. In this paper, we took this, this policy question on more directly. We're working towards national level indicators for the different biodiversity targets. And so here what we did was we contrasted some species that are um, that are tropical rainforest species in Mexico, and some species that are pine oak forest species. And what you see is relatively little loss in the pine oak forest species, and relatively more loss in the rainforest species. But the neat thing is, guess what? We're down below the national level. We can go pixel by pixel across a country because we have this nice density of records across the country. Um, so now what I'd like to show you is kind of where we're headed with this. Um, these are those specimen records that are kind of old, okay? The bulk of the specimen record was accumulated, let's say, before 1960. Well, then we have a new data set, which is called Averavis, which in Spanish kind of cutely means, uh, let's watch birds, okay? Um, and what you can see is nowhere near that density, but you can see a lot of points on the map. There are a lot of birders out there reporting their sightings. And you can also see that they report their sightings along roads. So I clearly have to do something to interpolate and get into those gaps. But that's where we use niche modeling. I know how to do that. So what we did was to try to calculate something that we call biodiversity intactness. So essentially, what we're trying to do is detect loss of species that should be at a site. And we've got to figure out what it means to, that you should be at a site. So what we did was we took our historical data set, which was the specimen data, and we used that to develop ecological niche models with respect to climate. 
And climate's nice because it kind of changes slowly, except for the last couple of decades. Um, we calibrated ecological niche models based on those historical data. That gave us the expectation of, based on climate variation across the region, which set of species should be found at each site. And then we can take those new data from Averaves, we can overlay them, and we can say which species are present somewhere they shouldn't be, based on our historical information, and which species are absent from somewhere where they should be. Obviously, we're going to have to coarsen our resolution a little bit because we don't have nice repeat sampling from the same sites. We're using what we call found data. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to develop some expectations about where species should be, and we're going to see how much current data either confirm or reject those expectations. And that confirmation is biodiversity intactness, and that rejection is biodiversity loss or biodiversity change. So there are our old data for the parrots of Mexico. Okay? And there are parrot detections from across Mexico that are new. Those are point, point records. Point records, yes. And again, we're going to have to do an interpolation stage because, you know, there's a major road, there's a major road, you can see roads up there. It's all access driven. Okay, big pieces of this landscape you can't get to. So, and it's also driven by where birders go for vacations. You know, Cancun, for example. So what we're going to do again is calibrate models based on the red triangles and then test their, their predictions based on the newer data decades later. By hand, I went in and I picked out regions that have been sampled reasonably well, both historically and particularly in the recent data. I don't want to do anything in this region because nobody's reporting new occurrences there. Right now that region's a little too dangerous to go to. So I picked out these regions and used them as kind of my, my areas where I'm going to um, evaluate biodiversity intactness. So I measured first, imagine I've got a list of species that based on the historical information are expected to be at a site. Maybe it's A, B, C, D, and E, five species. And then I look at what was actually seen in the present in that area. And maybe of those five species, two of them aren't there. And maybe there's one new species that wasn't there before. So my gains, I think I said was one, my losses were two, and the whole pool of species is, um, is the de denominator. So we're essentially asking what proportion of the species entered or exited the fauna. And then we can cal calculate a measure of intactness as just one minus turnover. It's not the only index. We could all propose alternatives. I don't care about that. It's the, it's the general workflow. Okay? So I took the turnover rates that I calculated for each of these points. Remember those little polygons that I put up there? And then I adjusted a surface. And where you see red is where there's lots of turnover. And where you see blue, there's not much turnover. And basically, what this first result says is Mexico City is the heart of it all. So I looked at the data, and it turns out that 
Mexico City, as I've known for years and years, has all sorts of introduced parrots. You know, lovebirds, African gray parrots, we've got them there, right? But also macaws from the southeast. So really, when you looked at turnover, Mexico City was turned over spectacularly all because of cage birds that had escaped. And if I'm caring about biodiversity conservation, Mexico City is just about the last place on Earth that I'm going to spend much time, right? So I'm going to get rid of those city-based introductions, and it's basically Mexico City and Monterrey. You've got a huge gap around Mexico City, so it's uh, extrapolated architecture. It actually probably goes. Like yeah, this. exactly. It's going to be zoom. <laughs> Yeah, these, these interpolation algorithms are another thing that, you know, it's, th that's detail, but yes, good point. So I'm going to get rid of those two cities because, again, I don't care what's happening on really destroyed urban landscapes. So let's look at the rest. And now look at where my red focus is. Look at this. We're seeing that whole rainforest region as a big focus of perturbation, non-intactness of parrot faunas. We're also seeing quite a bit of loss, although based on relatively few species in the interior west. So th this is just a prototype, it's not published yet, but essentially what we're doing is we're using climate, climatic niche um, signatures of species as a way of abstracting across a landscape and getting an expected distribution of species. And then we're looking at deviations from that expected based on an independent new data set, like what Les works with here in South Africa. But the important thing is that we're able to pair the historical with the new. Again, it's just an exploration. But notice, here's where I, I am excited about this. Notice that the whole map is one country. And remember, our global indicators never got us even down to one country. But here, we can talk about big foci of biodiversity loss. The southeast, the rainforests in Mexico, are totally screwed up. Okay, we can see it looking at land use change, and now we can see it looking at biodiversity change. So I would, I would say that the uh, that big global index, that's just a, a fundraising employee for some in the earth. It's the Biodiversity Informatics Initiative game. It, um, it, it, it helps nobody a stitch in anywhere on the planet to actually do something about needs in their patch. It's just, it's just headline stuff. Whereas, whereas something like this is actually some stuff that you can show your politicians and, and show them where the problem was. I, I'll, I'll be. That's, that's, that's where we ought to be working. I'll be a slight bit less pessimistic than you, Les, which is to say, I would rephrase what you just said, in that rarely does that marketing at the global level benefit local scale on the ground conservation. But I have to admit that you know the Nature Conservancy and Conservation International. They've brought in mega millions of dollars, and some of that has trickled down to conservation in local regions. And probably there are people around the table who can say, you know, I got some funding from, or our such and such national park was funded partly by. So I'll give them a little bit of credit, but you know where I stand. That global stuff is, is marketing, and those global indices that say, um, the planet is 30% worse, but the tropics are really bad and you're screwing it up for all of us. 
That doesn't do anybody any good. What does good as far as prioritization and as far as uh, real evidence-based planning and evidence-based uh, response to a changing landscape is something along these lines. It's based on primary data. It's repeatable, it's extendable, it's scalable. You can't, once you finish red list indexing the vertebrates, how many other major globally distributed taxa are there red list indices for? Are we gonna wait until we do multiple versions of the dragonflies of the world and of the sipunculate worms of the world? No, we don't have enough time. This can be done, or something like it, probably something better, can be done for any region of the world where you have an old and a new data set. That's all you need. 